The Southern Mediterranean, third century AD. The rich, verdant Roman cities of North Africa. While excavating in North Africa, archaeologists found a large number of incredible monuments, as well as enormous quantities of simple utensils, such as jars, pots, and farming tools. It suggested that the desert that we see now must have then set much farther back. Ancient travel books speak of vast expanses of fertile lands irrigated by copious waterways that stretched between the desert and the coast in the present-day territories of Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Thanks to its flourishing agriculture, North Africa enjoyed a period of great prosperity between the first and the fourth centuries AD, making fortunes for many men. Come with us as we explore this rich and tenacious civilization, uncovering fascinating cities and luxurious villas, and the way of life of a people who lived in a unique time. In Africa, the Roman Empire stretched from modern-day Morocco to Egypt. Verdant farming lands were located in Mauritania Tingitana, in what is now Morocco, Numidia and Mauritania Chesa Sorense, corresponding to present-day Algeria, and proconsular Africa in modern Tunisia. This ancient inscription was found in Mokhtar in Tunisia. It recounts the story of a life at that time. I was born into a poor family and lived by cultivating my fields from the day I was born. Neither my land nor I ever knew a moment's rest. Later, I left my village and worked for others for 12 years, sowing crops under the burning sun. Then I became the head of a team of harvesters and headed groups of farm laborers for 11 years. I saved enough money to become the owner of a house and a farm. Today, I live a life of comfort, and reaping the benefits of my way of life, I have also carved out a career in public administration. From a humble peasant, I have risen to become supreme magistrate. Men, learn to live an honest life. He who lives without cheating others merits to die covered in honors. The inscription became famous as a historical treatise of the period. It showed how one could rise up the social ladder and construct a fortune out of nothing. You only needed dreams and the energies to achieve them. In those days, there were millions of olive trees where now there are only desert sands. Olive oil was used in cooking, as a detergent, and as a toner while bathing. Olive oil was also used to provide fuel for lamps, which burned up huge quantities of it. It was here in North Africa that Roman colonists produced most of the olive oil consumed in Rome, earning a great deal of money and managing to prosper despite high taxes and the encroaching desert. Thermal baths and pools were built in great public complexes that varied in the level of luxury offered. Six were found in the archaeological site of Banassa in Morocco.
With further excavations, archaeologists found that the city also contained several oil presses, mills, and warehouses. Numerous villas were found in the countryside around Banasa, ancient versions of modern farmhouses. It was the perfect farming business of ancient times. The farms produced the olives, the oil presses turned them into oil, and the oil was then sent off to the Italian markets. The thermal baths satisfied the needs of landowners, but also of simple peasants and laborers who wanted to enjoy themselves in the city, relaxing, recovering from their hard work, and finding refuge from the great African heat. Like many laborers today, farm workers had to be migratory, to go where the work was. This could mean lands far away, where the economy was stronger. The workers would have traveled in a caravan covering great distances. One popular destination was proconsular Africa, modern-day Tunisia. One of the most important cities of the time was located here, Thesdras, now called El Gem. The houses here were built on a terrace system and whitewashed to reflect the rays of the sun, not unlike houses in the city today. But the magnificence of the city's architecture was the amphitheater of Thesdras, built in 230 AD. Excluding the Colosseum, the mother of all amphitheaters, the construction in Thesdras was second only to the amphitheater in Capua. It is the biggest building in the Roman Empire to be erected beyond the borders of Italy. The main axis measured 485 feet. The slightly shorter axis was 400 feet, forming an almost circular ellipsis. The internal arena covered an area of 213 feet by 128 feet. The amphitheater could seat 40,000 people, and the most frequent entertainment was gladiator contests. However, despite the comfort provided by awnings, the building did not boast the lavish decorations and pomposity of the Colosseum. The arches, though they rose up to a height of over 131 feet, do not have the breadth of the Roman Colosseum. They are narrower and therefore less visually impressive. This is due to the fact that the rather brittle local African stone was not strong enough to bear the weight of wider arches. This is why the amphitheater in Thysdrus rose up over three orders of austere arches which were adorned with composite Corinthian columns. From an architectural point of view, this model breaks with the Italian design by its essentiality. There are fewer cornices and columns, and the facades are solid. Indeed, the African style is simply not as rich. On the other hand, African public works could not draw on Roman tax revenues. The governor of Africa, Gordianus, built this colossus in the 3rd century AD in what amounted to a direct challenge to Rome. He was actually encouraging a revolt against the exorbitant taxes imposed by Rome. He was strategizing from a position of strength. In the later stages, the Roman Empire had become weak and unproductive and was able to live in luxury only due to the taxes it collected from the provinces. On the other hand, the provinces forged ahead, being highly productive, their political and economic importance on the ascent. They began to provide emperors, such as the African Septimius Severus and his son Caracalla. Money can indeed bring power, and the olive plantations here 
pushed many to the top of Rome's social structure. In another area of Tunisia, archaeologists brushed away the desert sands to discover, once again, an example of the importance of entertainment in ancient cultures. They found rows of steps, part of which were wide and comfortable, while others were shallower, with each category kept strictly separated from the other. Eventually, it became clear that they formed part of the theater of Bulu Regia, which dates back to the second century AD. The wider and more comfortable steps were reserved for the wealthy and famous, while the common people were relegated to the narrow steps. Bulu Regia was a provincial city compared to the capital Thesdras. Not surprisingly, its economy was heavily oriented in the olive trade, the abundant farmland around the city made it an attractive settlement for those wanting to make their money in agriculture. The theater was an ideal place for making important contacts. After the show, you could befriend some of the most influential people in the city by going down to the official reception rooms. One puzzling factor for archaeologists was why did a city with such a large theater have such a relatively small urban center with modest buildings? And where were the houses of the rich and the nobility? A find that helped shed light on this question was this mosaic portraying Venus with Cupid astride a dolphin. It is the pride of Bularegia and one of the most beautiful examples of African mosaic art. But this discovery also spawned a mystery. In spite of the fact that it was exquisitely made, the mosaic was found in the basement of a simple dwelling that seemed completely lacking in prestige. Solving this enigma led to the discovery of a building type that is totally unique of its kind. The dwellings here that date back to the third century AD have a relatively simple upper floor and a luxurious and ornate basement that was dug 16 feet into the ground so occupants could escape the African heat. Wealthy families would stay here during the day and then in the evening, when it was cooler, they would go to the upper floors. This is an example of a typical residence dating from the Imperial Age, containing about 10 rooms and belonging, in all probability, to a senator who would have lived here with his family and numerous servants. The part of the house seen from the outside could be as large as 8,000 square feet, set around this peristyle, the largest colonnade in the house. This staircase led to the lower floor. This is where the most luxurious and richly decorated part of the house was located, including sumptuous guest rooms. During excavation work, it was discovered that the cool temperature of the basement was not due solely to its depth. The Romans applied an absolutely innovative technique here that can be compared to modern thermal insulation. These cross vaults have an air chamber that separates them from the burning floors overhead. The centering was not made out of wood, as this would have been a scarce material here in Africa, but rather out of clay, more precisely, by using interlocking earthenware pipes that were held in place between the grout and the floor. Since these grand, cool houses were looked upon as palatial refuges, the owners might invite prestigious guests to join them there in magnificent banquets, where they would seek support for some political measure they were backing.
Probably the most important room in the house was the triclinium, though you might think it was some kind of bordello with its luxurious furnishings and exquisite mosaics and couches that looked invitingly sensual. It was actually the dining room. Guests would eat lying on one side around a lavishly set table. The feasts of the African aristocracy were something to behold. This is the account of Apuleius, a Numidian writer. In the triclinium, I found a large number of guests, the cream of the city's aristocracy. Sumptuously laid tables gleaming with cedar and ivory, couches covered with fabrics interwoven with gold, curly-headed youths offering vintage wines and chalices studded in precious stones. You could find everything here, even the impossible. Uncovering fascinating facts of ancient civilizations is one of the marvelous rewards of being an archaeologist. There's a lot that we've discovered, and a lot more still to come. Archaeology does not concern itself only with monumental works such as temples, amphitheaters, and tombs. Ben Franklin coined the phrase, man is a tool-making animal. Archaeologists must go beyond the major constructions and analyze commonly used materials in order to give us the wealth of knowledge that we have today. Here is an oil press, a perfectly preserved millstone for oil that was unearthed in Volubilis, capital of ancient Mauritania, near present-day Morocco. Thanks to similar finds, Museums such as the Museum of Roman Civilization in Rome have been able to construct faithful reproductions of ancient tools and recreate long-lost trades. Along with writings from the era, archaeologists have been able to ascertain the importance of olive oil trade and marketing, and from there, to see how oil brought money, and money brought power. This bronze statue was also unearthed in Volubilis. It is three feet in length, weighs more than 35 pounds, and is richly decorated. Yet, it is simply one fold on a cloak. Archaeologists found it at the base of this monumental arch and linked it to one of the biggest bronze statues that ever existed, Emperor Caracalla riding on a chariot which they knew was set on top of an arch in ancient times. The arch was the entry point to the city. You would enter the city traveling along the Decumanus, which was lined with shops and teeming with traffic and activity. Volubilis was the central administrative city for this part of Roman Africa, responsible for producing grain and exporting it to Rome. The Forum and the Basilica that towered over it were places where discussions were held and important decisions made, perhaps regarding the neighboring Berber tribes whom the Romans never managed to suppress. In the Forum was a beautiful temple that had been built to imitate the capital in Rome. Leading up to it was this flight of 13 steps, to which the term monumental could well be applied, given the relatively small dimensions of the temple itself, just 36 feet long and 26 feet wide. Like the capital in Rome, the temple was dedicated to the Capitoline Trinity of Gods, Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva, to whom senators might have prayed for assistance in their political careers. Initially, it was the center of the city of Volubilis, with its well-preserved public buildings, that attracted the attention of archaeologists. Subsequently, however, the outlying areas were to yield some interesting finds. All 
of the houses in Volubilis date from the 2nd and 3rd centuries AD. The House of the Ephebus, which takes its name from the discovery here of this wonderful bronze statue of a young man, was owned by a wealthy olive grower. Here he would hold lavish parties and banquets, perhaps to promote his public image. This is the marvelous House of Cop. The luxurious House of the Horseman, like most of the local residences, was filled with bronze statues, which are now kept in the museum in Rabat, the capital of Morocco. some of the most beautiful mosaics found in all of northern Africa. A chariot drawn by geese. Diana bathing, surprised by Acteon. And Bacchus and the Four Seasons. These two bronze busts were also found inside the house. One, with its characteristic Roman features, portrays Cato the Younger, while the other, of unmistakable African origin, is the cultured Numidian king, Juba II. These two figures bear witness to the racial mix that flourished in North Africa and to the civilizations that resulted from it. Perhaps more than any other city, Volubilis serves as one of the finest examples of Rome's integration of African lands. The city prospered under its conquerors. It took the best Rome had to offer and made it its own. In this case, you might say, to the loser went the spoils. <laughs>